my message for tonight was sparked by Psalm 28. And I was beginning in verse 1. Unto thee I, will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me. Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. And this is the passage that caught me. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. And I was just thinking about this this way by which some can get drawn away from uh, from that which is good and, and right and uh, gospel uh, Christ honoring and they can uh, it says drawn away with the wicked with the workers of iniquity that there's a luring there's a there's a, a relationships that uh, don't have person's best interest at heart and they want them to walk away from Christ and his gospel and so I thought this is a especially for the young people it's a good time to go back over some fundamentals of the things that um, some of the uh, ways which this, the sheep are attacked by the wolves of the world and uh, if, I, if I could jump to the last passage first I don't usually do this but Jesus sent his apostles out as uh, sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, we should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so I thought it's good to talk about being as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove with regard to the wolves that surround in this world. That's what Jesus said. And so I thought, well, point number one, um, as far as our relationships in the world and our friends and acquaintances, um, <clears throat> Could, and, and family members for that matter. Number one, uh, it should not be the case that someone under the sound of the gospel should take spiritual counsel from them. Uh, I say someone under the sound of the gospel, that means whether they know they're a believer uh, or whether they don't, but they're under the sound of the gospel and God is, they're listening to, uh, to the gospel and God is drawing them, that is to say they keep coming back, that someone in that situation uh, ought not to be taking spiritual counsel from members of those of the world. And uh, Psalms 1 points that out right off the bat of all 120-something Psalms. It starts out with a big punch in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate. The, uh, both day and night and you'll be like a, tr a tree planted by the rivers of water to bring forth fruit in his season his leaf won't wither whatsoever he doeth shall prosper so there's this idea that a man ought not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly and Pastor Warner made a point many many times over the years this doesn't mean ungodly counsel that is so you can listen to your friends 90% of the time when they give you good advice but then once in a while you, you say well I'll, I'll separate between that no he says Counsel of the godly means is simply that they're feeding you uh, their ideas about the things of God. Uh, a person ought not work walk in the counsel of the ungodly, listening to their uh, ruminations, their thoughts, their enticements, their uh, their uh, sales pitches for their God, their their fanciful notions of all that stuff. And I would go beyond that to say also, just in terms of uh, directions for your own life and, and things things of that nature, uh, you have to be very careful there. Um, that, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> it could be, uh, uh, you know, whether it's your love life or your job or your schooling or, you know, you do this, you do that. I would strongly urge you to avoid the counsel of the ungodly in major uh, d decisions or decisions that affect your life. They will affect your life and affect the direction of your life and the trajectory of your life. Um, the, and we'll see why in a minute as we go through some further things here. But it does say here, <clears throat> continuing on in Psalm 1 and verse 4, the ungodly aren't so. That is to say, they're not like trees planted by the rivers of water. They're not, they're not connected to the gospel truth. But rather, uh, they're like the chaff uh, which the wind drives away. 
they, 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 therefore, <coughs> uh, the ungodly shall not stand in, in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The point is, uh, they're not, they're not the same. Their, their foundation, their root, where they're drawing their ideas from, uh, uh, is not the same. It's not based on the rivers of water, which is a, a symbolic of the gospel truth. So, point number two is that a person under the sound of the gospel shouldn't covet the approval of friends and associates outside the world, uh, in the world. Um, and I would warn you that, you know, coveting their approval and their friendship, you know, can mean, and I say this as a warning, can mean that you covet their ways. Uh, if you, their friendship means so much to you, you know, you, you have to turn, turn to James chapter 4. It should be a warning to you. James 4 and, and, and verse 4 he's, he says, uh, Adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Um, he's talking here more about just the whole idea of loving the things of the world and that which is opposed to, to Christ and his gospel, not so much about friendship per se. But I think that the point is still true that if you want to be uh, friends with the world and the way they're doing things it's going to come at a price it's going to come at, a, at an awful cost and um, <clears throat> loving those who hate the gospel in particular uh, brings upon brings out the wrath of God I'll see you'll see that in just a minute so <clears throat> there's a wholesome relationship we can have with our friends in the world uh, we can be their very best friend, and we and I'm going to make a point here in just a minute that we are their best friends, um, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. But there's a there's something wrong when a believer is willing to compromise the gospel to uh, gain the approval of friends of the world. That's a problem. That that's a problem that doesn't end well. And point number three is being a friend to others uh, is good and right whether they're inside or outside the church, um, allowing friends to influence your thinking about Christ and the gospel or your behavior or conversation in the world won't end well. In other words, it's a good thing to, be ha to have friends, to be their honest friend. Uh, keep your word, eschew evil, love the good. Uh, turn to Galatians 5.10. Galatians uh, 5 and verse 10. I think, wait a minute, I think it should be 6.10. Uh, yeah, in, in, six, in Galatians 6.10, uh, it says, uh, beginning in verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those, uh, unto them who are of the household of faith. And so there's nothing, nothing at all... Uh, wrong and, and doing good to all men is a good thing uh, I'm sure that I, I'm I'm sure that those outside of Christ who aren't under the sound of the gospel that believers are their very best friends they're their very best friends they tell the truth they will uh, direct them in a different direction they'll comfort them in a different way they'll encourage them in a different way they, their worldview and their view of the way things happen and the view of God Almighty are so different that uh, that uh, they they will notice and uh, it will be beneficial to them to be your friend. Second, turn to Second Chronicles chapter nineteen. But a line can be crossed. Where those who believe the gospel are adversely affected by those around them and that I encourage you not to let that line be crossed <clears throat> in 2nd Corinthians in 19 beginning in verse 1 and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem and Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him and said 
said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore, therefore, is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. And nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. In other words, this was a believer. He's not saying you don't know the Lord, but he's saying you've crossed the line here. Your affection for these who hate God is not is not right. It's not well, and it's un, it's undermining uh, the ministry, if you will, and uh, and it's undermining you. And it says, therefore, wrath is upon you from the Lord. And uh, there was uh, that's an, that was an issue. Turn to First Kings. And chapter uh, 11, here's some of the things that go wrong. <coughs> we'll see a few of those. In uh, First Kings, this story of Solomon, and you can, you know, you can read Proverbs back and forth, and you can see all kinds of wise counsel God provides through uh, the wisdom of Solomon. And yet we see, even in the case of Solomon, whom God said was the wisest man the world ever knew. In verse uh, 1 of 11 and 1 Kings, chapter 11. But, but King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, here's the point, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives and princesses and hundreds of concubines. And, and his wives turned away his heart. There's the issue. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of his David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as David his father did. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, and the, the abomination of Moab, a hill in the hill that's before Jerusalem. And for Moab, the abomination of the children of... Moab was the one that they offered babies to. Uh, and, uh, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed them to their God. This is what I talked about, I guess, last week when I said uh, this is the non-judgmental thinking trap. I'm not going to judge you and your gods. I'm just going to roll with that. Yeah, you need a you need a temple. Sure, go ahead. And uh, Solomon fell into that trap. Solomon was a believer. Solomon knew better, but his heart was turned away, and uh, it was sadness to him and to those around him and to the nation and to the church, if you will. Turn to uh, Judges. Throughout the scripture, there are warning stories of people who let the friends and, and, and loves of this world undermine their life. In Judges in chapter 16, and this is kind of a crazy story. In Judges, uh, in Judges 16 and verse 4, it came to pass afterward that he, that Samson, loved the woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. He got so infatuated with this woman, so crazed was his love for this woman, that his own life, put, the, the fact that she wanted him nothing but dead didn't make any difference and um, it says and the lords of the Philistines came to the, to this Delilah and says entice him and see where, wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him that we may bind him to afflict him uh, she, she didn't care that he was going to get hurt in the worst possible way these are not nice people in the Middle East as we know and we'll, and, uh, we'll give the, every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So she was going to do this for money. She was, uh, and Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou might be bound to afflict thee. <laughs> she was very open about her, uh, her plans. 
And Samson tells her a lie. If you do that, you know, if you wrap me with this seven green wise, uh, that'll get me. Then the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven green wise, which he which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. And there were men lying in wait, abiding in her chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he, of course, he broke free, and uh, his strength wasn't known. And this went on time and time again. He knew she was no good. He knew she was no good, but he was so blinded by his passion that uh, it ended up being uh, ended up being his death, is what. It, but uh, in in the end, nevertheless, God never took his favor or love from from Samson. I, I'll say that to encourage, but it was not uh, a highlight in his life. Turn to uh, Galatians. In chapter 4, and Paul saying, beginning in verse 8, Howbeit when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods, which the people of the world do, which is what we all did. Uh, we're born into this, doing service unto things that are not God's, because, in fact, we think we're God, truth be told. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, wherein ye desire again to be in bondage? And the point I want to make here is that this going and uh, running with the crowd, the approval of friends, is its own form of bondage. It's its own form of bondage. He goes on to say, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in, in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all, and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that this, this notion that uh, uh, God has saved me and, 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 and I'm going to be as the world is, the weak and beggarly elements, that's all good and fine. Um, that's, a, that's a bondage. That's a bondage. A bondage meaning it's a, it's a burden, it's a drag, it's a, <clears throat> it, it, you know, Jesus said, I, you know, uh, he's, he came to make, make believers free and, and if, you know, uh, the, to be free indeed. And uh, to run with the crowd is, is, the, is to have less freedom in your life, less gospel freedom. And that's, that's the truth. Point number four, scripture is full of positive direction. Uh, on how we ought to converse in this world, how we ought to walk. I'll just share a few thoughts on that. And then I'll, um, so many different places throughout, you know, you can just open the book, the Bible anywhere, flop it open, and you're going to get some direction on this point. But uh, in John chapter 1, I'll just share a few items here. Uh, in verse 7, uh, it says, But walk in the light, as he is in the light. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, which we ought, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. So there's this notion of believers should walk in the light, as he in the light. In Romans 12, in chapter 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Conformity with the world. What does that mean? That means I look like they look like. I do what they do. That's conformity. We walk, walk in lockstep. Their world is my world. I do. We can't separate us. We're, we're, we look and look and walk and talk and move and behave exactly the same. That's conformity. The scripture says, "Don't be conformed to this world." be transformed by the now you can't transform yourself by the way but that's not a, something you can do like well I, I'm gonna whip up some transformation in my mind this this Romans 12 2 humbles you to seek God and say God but for your grace I'm going to conform to the world I need by your grace and mercy from heaven above a transforming in my mind so that that what lures me the, the, the lure of the world no longer uh, affects me. 
<clears throat> in Ephesians, in chapter 5, and what, there's a whole sequence of things that Paul says. He said in verse 1, Be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. savor. But he goes, but fornication and uncleanness and covetousness and, and, and go on filthiness and so on and so on. Uh, whoremongering, unclean. He goes, uh, all of these things, uh, the wrath of God comes on the, the uh, children of disobedience in, in verse 6. It says, uh, uh, but in verse 7, be ye not therefore partakers with him. I think that's pretty clear. Be ye not therefore partakers with him. For you are sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all. Now, again, this is something you can't manufacture this. This is a humbling statement. This is a thing where if you're involved in verses 3 through 6 and have no ability to undo that, that means you have a great need. That means you have a great need and you need to go before God Almighty and say, I'm walking in darkness. And outside of Christ's sacrifice, I have no hope. Goes, but you who are sometimes darkness are now light in the Lord. And he goes on to say, uh, have no fellowship in verse 11 with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done in secret, which is where they like to do things, and the way they like to keep things in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And then verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. There's your hope. Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as wise. And there's the scripture direction. And that also, by the way, in verse 16, says, Redeemed the time. That has a positive effect on everything and everybody in your world. And that's that's a blessing. Um I'll skip over Colossians 3 1. It says, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's more encouragement to where your mind should be. So many things in the scripture point you toward Christ, for looking at Him, um, more fully understanding his, his work, more fully understanding the God of the scripture, so that and applying that unlearning to your situation and asking God for direction in your life how you should relate to those around you and point five is don't be naive about those that are around you the attentions of the world in proverbs 4 and 16 now that's kind of interesting this is coming out of proverbs solomon said this the same guy who later in life had his issues but he said in in, in, in proverbs 4 16 speaking of the of those outside of the, of the sound of the gospel he said they don't sleep except they've done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall I know personally, I know by personal experience, before I ever heard the gospel, that describes me to a T. That is the lost, undone world, um, mischief, ungodliness, all the things in Ephesians 5, you name it, if there's trouble to be had, human nature will run to it. And you need to understand that even uh, our friends who are more moral than others, and some are, to the world's eye, they're, they're not motivated by the, the God of this universe, and therefore there are things you can't see in their motivation, and there are things that you can't see in their mind, and I can assure you that they fit in this verse just like everybody else outside of Christ. And they would enjoy some to fall and be like them. Nothing makes them happier than that. So in conclusion, my counsel would be that as, so long as friends maintain an open mind about the gospel that, that you hear and love, there's hope of real friendship. Turn to 1 Kings. This is kind of a, an interesting thing. In 1 Kings chapter 5, David had a relationship with a fellow named Hiram, who was the king of Tyre. Now, to my knowledge, Tyre is not was not Israel. It wasn't Judah. It wasn't. Um, he was just, in effect, someone from another town, someone from another place. And yet, there was a 
beautiful relationship between this Hiram and David. I consider it a beautiful relationship. And in, in, look in, uh, in verse 1 of uh, 1 Kings 5, it said, And Hiram king of Tyre sent his servants unto Solomon. This is after he heard that David had died. For he had heard that, the, that they had anointed Solomon king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. This guy was a friend to David. Appreciated him, liked him. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not build a house in the name of the Lord his God, for wars were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord uh, my God has given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, he purposes to build the temple, and so on. Uh, in, in verse 6, Now therefore command that you hew me cedars out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint, for you know that there is not among us any that can skill that can skill to hew timber like unto the Zidonians, which was Tyre. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which is given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which you have sent for me, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar, and concerning timber of fir. My servants will do this, my servants will do that. And that's the way that they rolled. And it's just a situation where uh, something that God did in his heart of Hiram caused him to love those that love the gospel. And I don't know, and, and here to even comment upon and bless the Lord. Now that's, uh, even though he wasn't, to my knowledge, uh, and he was an outsider. But he didn't oppose, he didn't war with David, he didn't hate David, he wasn't giving him a wrong direction. But rather, he was uh, a, f a friend, a friend in this world. Now, when friends turn a corner, this is, uh, uh, and they, they they hear this gospel that you believe, and they begin opposing it in overt ways and covert ways. They begin to mock and turn and encourage you to go a different direction. It's my opinion, I believe the opinion of the scripture, it's time to shake the dust off your feet and find a new friend or new friends or companions. So uh, I've seen it in my life and I can think about it in my family. When they make statements like my one brother did, you know, I hate your God and I hate your gospel. Well, that's a pretty clear statement. And that's a relationship changer. Uh, okay, that's fine. That doesn't mean I don't care for him as a brother. It doesn't mean I haven't done things for him to help him since then. And I will. But it's a different relationship. It's a different relationship. And it's we're not, we're not chums. Uh, I'm not letting him uh, into my world or taking his advice or trying to covet his favor or gain his approval. It's, it's, it's in many ways, it's uh, a large part of the relationship is over. And that's the way it is. Um, uh, you know, Jesus said that sort of thing would happen. Said that sort of thing would happen. And so um, I encourage you in your relationships to manage that. Don't go the way of Samson. Don't go the way of Solomon in terms of his later, late in life. Uh, turning, you know, where uh, the friends around him turned the corner, opposed the gospel, but they were okay with that. And it dragged them down. And Or in... Uh, or, uh, the king who, uh, with the, where Jehu the seer came and said, the wrath of God is on you on this. You're, you're loving those that hate the Lord. This is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. So I encourage you, as the gospel encourages you, to um, walk in the light. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't seek its approval. Be a friend of this world. Be a friend of the people of this world. Encourage them, like I said last week, and say, come and see. Come and hear. That, you're the, that is the best friend that they will ever have. And you will be the best friend that they will ever have. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That's the only hope that they have. If, if, if you know, I don't know that there's other gospel in this area. I know there's other gospel around the world. But, but right now, in this area, you're a, you're a sound out of hope to them in a very, very dark world. So I'll remind you of Matthew 10, 16, which I started off the message on. Jesus sent his... his apostles out as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's where you exist. That's the world that you and I live in. We are sheep in the midst of wolves. So it's in your best interest to be as wise as a serpent 
and as harmless as a dove. You're their very best friend, but don't be a fool. <laughs>